All right, we're live. Uh, and today I'm here live with uh, Matt Spencer, and we are talking about uh, the home buying process and just kind of the initial phases of the home buying process and, and stuff like that. But uh, how are you doing today, Matt? I'm hanging in there as, as normal, as usual. Yeah, it's beautiful out there. It's a little warm. It's got me got me sweating. Up, so well, I've been in like working from home pretty much all day. It's a great catch up paperwork day. So I've been in my classic car t shirt, sweatpants, and I was like, all right, I better throw something on for this. <laughs> but I loaded up the car and I didn't realize how warm it was outside. And so just like every single video we've done, I'm sweaty. But it's just <laughs> And then, you know, I'm married to Christina, so I mean, how how hot is it in the house? And it's 75. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably get home and it'll be the same thing. So uh, I feel your pain, that's for sure. Um, well, so guys, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to comment uh, down below and let us know uh, what questions you may have. Uh, let us know you're watching, say hi, whatever. Um, but yeah, um, so you you ready to get started? Uh, actually, before we get started on the home buying process, you give us a quick idea, kind of what you're seeing in the market, how the market's going. Uh, don't touch on any upcoming listings, though. All right, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want anybody getting in any trouble. All right. That's something we're gonna get to the bottom of. We just need better def defined definitions. Um, <laughs> Real estate market, I'm sure it's totally different for everybody. So my one little viewpoint is all you're getting. I yeah. work, um, I'm a referral type word of mouth guy. So therefore, I, I happen to work with a lot of people around my age. I'm 35, so I got a lot of 20, 30-year-old shoppers. Mm -hmm. The What I see as being the most active buyers is the, the younger crowd, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's just my perspective or if it's because <laughs> they're taking advantage of low interest rates. Um you know, typically the younger somebody is in their finances and, and jobs and things like that, like they don't have big 401ks and big stock markets that might have really devastated them in the last month. So I think the younger people are out and about more, but it could just be my perspective. Listings wise, if you got a good product, if it's somewhat fixed up, it's it's hot. And yeah. the thing is with that I've seen, so I think it's some of my perspective because I'm seeing all age brackets making offers on my property so it's probably just my perspective of who i work with the most in buyers yeah but all in all like uh, it's not slow it's not stagnant like real estate's rolling we'll see yeah. what the months bring but um it's, it's like a freight train right now so i'm not even sure how much it will slow down if at all yeah no it's good yeah i mean from my perspective you know it's the market's definitely rolling i mean it's going fast the hardest part right now is uh, finding homes for some of the buyers that, you know, we have. So, um, you know, if, so guys, uh, remember, ask away. We're going to be talking about the home buying process in a second. So let us know if you have any questions on any of that. Um, but before we jump into that in the first few steps of home buying, uh, let's talk about the real estate agent, right? Um yeah, I've heard plenty of people talk uh, and say before, like, oh, what what do I need a real estate agent to buy a house for? Like, I I can find a house myself and I'll probably get a better deal if I just go into an open house or if I find somebody, if I go somewhere and just put, a, put in an offer with uh, the listing agent or something like that. Can talk a little bit about your role and maybe some of those misconceptions? Sure. Again, very, very perspective based. Uh, there's sure. a lot of do it yourselfers as the millennials are growing up and buying first and second houses. Their mindset for one is to do things on their own, kind of like I like to be with a lot of stuff. Um, so I, I understand it. Um, what people need to realize is, is the traditional route that houses are listed for sale. So the way houses are listed with a sign in the yard, I'm not going to get in and talk about different commissions here. But there is a commission that the listing agent and these sellers agree to. Typically, there's a percentage of that that's already set up for a buyer's agent. So if you're thinking that you can go into a listing unrepresented and you're saving money or that you don't have to pay a real estate agent, that's definitely a misconception. And the listing agent should definitely point that out to you super clear. I always do. And I know I've lost deals that could have been double-sided because I emphasize so much that they should and 
could have their own representation. So mm-hmm. I think that just off the bat that you're going to save money for that reason, the listing agent will get twice the commission unless you work something else differently. And, and, and I do, um, uh, buyer's agent. So the way our industry is set up, it's kind of like when you sell a house, you get hit from a couple angles. When you're buying a house, you get all the freebies and all the good stuff. So as a buyer, typically you have an agent working for you for free because they're getting paid a piece of the listing agent's commission. Um, in today's world, most sellers pay a, a nice chunk uh, of your closing cost assistance. Uh, it's normal to, I think we can talk about percentages there. It's very common to see 3% closing cost assistance kind of coming back to a buyer. Um, so inspection wise, you're, you got a few out of pocket expenses that we'll go over in a minute, but really the industry set up for the buyer to have all the advantages and the seller's the one kind of on defense and, mm-hmm. and helping the buyer and helping the agent and helping everybody else. Does mm-hmm. that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. No, that was a great, uh, great answer. I mean, I think it's important to have somebody on your side, right? Um, and if you yeah. kind of go in unrepresented, you, you may not necessarily have that. Right. Yeah. In Virginia, uh, we had not to get way off. There's different mm-hmm. types of agency designated, um, dual agency. At yeah. the end of the day, just remember this, a, a agent can really only a hundred percent represent one party to a transaction. And if you're the listing agent, then it's the sellers and that's it. They can help a buyer. They can do paperwork. They can facilitate. They have to be honest, but mm-hmm. they have to give no advantages, no inside information, but anything the buyer slips out of their mouth or spits or anything, they are supposed to run and tell the seller. So just be careful if you're if you're working with an unrepresented type scenario. No offense to that agent, they're they're doing what they're legally bound to, which is 100% represent the seller to the best of their ability. And that's when just forming teams really in real estate, you have the buyer has a real estate agent, most likely a guy like Chris being the um, loan officer. You're gonna have a title or a, a lawyer to handle your closing. You're gonna have your team of inspectors, contractors, all that. So it's like team here Mm -hmm. and then not to say that the bad guys but like the seller has their agent their backing firm their set of inspectors possibly Mm -hmm. they're going to try to fight for for control so it's kind of like you're drawing a line down the middle and uh forming teams and that way everybody's got everybody's back at the same time don't get caught up on the line in the sand everybody needs to reach the same goal you know the sellers are trying to sell the buyers are trying to buy you need to try to work together and don't get emotional yeah no that's good all right, so let's jump a little bit more into the steps of buying a home. Um, so, you know, typically, you know, how do you get in touch with a buyer uh, for you yourself? And, and um, what's that first step for you and, and with the buyers that you work with? Buyers come from all such different angles and degrees. Um, I, I love, I'll, I probably drive it home too much. I like being a word of mouth referral guy. So most of my business is past clients, friends, things like that. Can you still mm-hmm. see me? I'm black on my screen. There we go. Um, so most of the people come to me, which is awesome. And it te- de- that definitely takes a while to get to that level. Um, but it's just awesome having a, a, a well, that's enough of that. Uh, so most people come to me. I do get random contacts through Zillow and other third party websites like that. Um, when you have listings, you get phone you get phone calls off of signs, and very soon into that conversation, we have the conversation that we just talked about with, hey, do you have an agent? If if you don't, you know, here's the rules of our state. Um, sometimes I get a buyer from lenders uh, that's already that's already approved, um, but typically, I guess what we're going to get to and might as well go to it is is the step one. So to me, when people ask me what is step one, I usually have an answer like two answers, and I don't have a preference. Most people want step one to be talk to Chris, talk to a lender, see where you stand pre-qualified. Some people look at it as they're wasting time. Um, some people say that it's because you need to know uh, what price point you're in, or you might need to pay down some debt or just move some debt around. Uh, I, I love meeting first time one-on-one, whether they've talked to an, a lender or not. If, if they meet with me first, step two is going to be talking to Chris or one of my lenders. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't care if you've been approved or not. I got no problem giving you an hour or two of my time to talk. Really not supposed to be showing houses to people that aren't pre-approved. Uh, the, a lot of the listings is that's kind of a, wouldn't even say spoken. It's even written sometimes that they don't want you in your house if you're not pre-approved. Well, Those agents are going to drive you around. Right. right. Yeah. But uh, step one is for me is a nice sit down, private, either at my office, at your house, coffee shops, but sometimes they're too loud. 
And I like you to bring all your questions, all your concerns, things you're fuzzy on, like, hey, how the heck did the guy I'm meeting with today get paid? Bring anything at all that even if it's blunt or you think you're going to offend me, I promise you're not. Bring all your questions, bring a notepad. I will not stop. Like, you know, we got to cut off at an hour, hour and a half because I'll oh, be yeah. there. Um, <laughs> so what are some of the questions, some of the things you may talk about with uh, um, somebody in those buyer consultations? I open the floor typically and don't have a actual presentation. I like to start with their questions, but soon on we, we go with <clears throat> like the process, step one, step two, step three, step four. And another topic is like out of pocket expenses. And I'll tell you right now, as a buyer in this marketplace, your out of pocket expenses is really your earnest money deposit, which we're going to come back to in a minute. EMD. Another out of pocket expense is going to be the home inspection. And then pretty much the appraisal and We'll let Chris talk on that. It, all these things, the home inspection is a one time, bam, you sign a check, pay cash, whatever. That's, you're not getting that back. The earnest money and the appraisal is almost your front and money for the deal. But depending on your loan type, closing costs, things like that, it's going to come back to you. And we'll let Chris talk about that. But sure. sure. Yeah. Talk about the few out of pocket expenses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It depends on what they, if, if they've talked to a lender or not, if they're a veteran or what, you know, they can tell me a little bit about them and I can usually kind of have an idea of which loan type they're going to be in so we can explore some options just so they, Go to the lender ready. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So first of all, hey guys uh, watching. Uh, thanks for watching. Let us know who's out there and say hi. Um, secondly, so we'll talk about pre-qualification now. So you know, generally what will happen from there is usually Matt will talk to the person, do his buyer consultation. And I usually get a call uh, from Matt or a text saying, hey, I expect a call from John Smith. He's going to be giving you a call. Or can you call John Smith um, about getting, seeing if he pre-qualifies, right? And so from there, I just take a as full application as I can, um, you know, run the credit, ask him all the income questions, all that fun stuff. And then, you know, I'll call them back, run through the different options that they may have uh, for purchasing a home, right? So... Yes, it looks, you know, based off of what I've seen, you probably are pre-qualified. We just need, you know, it looks, these are the programs that you qualify for based off of the information I've been given. And then from there, uh, you know, what I like to do is um, work on getting somebody fully underwritten and approved while they're working with Matt on finding that home, uh, right? So we call that like TBD approval to be determined uh, approval. So meaning they're approved for however much they're looking to buy. And um, it makes it makes it a lot easier for them. And uh, I feel like it makes it easier for Matt when they can submit an offer with instead of a pre-approval letter or a pre-qualification letter, they're getting a conditional approval letter. So um, yeah, I mean, the pre-qualification goes do it. Can I pause you there and ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm grinning too. My, my, I love my dog to death. He, he's never snored. He's over here snoring and it's cracking me up. It's the funniest <laughs> thing. Never heard him do it before. Um, the question I have is, yeah. I've never actually asked you this. There is a difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval, correct? Um, it depends on the bank too, because different banks call things different. Yeah, banks. a lot of it's just based off of, it, it can and can't. You know, sometimes right. I'll answer it that way. You don't have to worry about saying anything wrong. Yeah. Um, what I've noticed in, in my dealings is there's pre-qualifications and some people call them pre-approvals. Now your bank might just call it. I think in the real estate's mind, the real estate agent's mind, especially as a listing agent where you see offers coming in, there's certain things you're looking for. And when I see pre-qualification from a bank that I know does also pre-approvals, I think, okay, Maybe they haven't gone as far as they need to. So again, from a real estate agent perspective, pre-qualification sometimes means you've talked to a lender. You might have told them what you made last year. You might have told them what debt you had. And you right. might have even told them what you think your credit score was. And to pick on a group that still does a great job, but like online banking, online.com, like mm -hmm. they're very fast to send over a printed out pre-qualification letter. I yeah. know all this because I went through this when I was like 22, 23. I thought I was approved for a tons of money. And my credit score was not. So pre-qualifications pre can mean can uh, mislead you. Yeah. To me, a pre-approval letter means you've talked to Chris or a lender. They have ran your credit. They have started looking at your finances, taxes, bills, 
a pre a pre approval letter to me is much stronger. Now yeah. there are some banks that just call them across the board a pre qualification. I think most agents know which banks those are, and that helps clear that up too. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree. I mean, I think it's important. Um, you know, so for us, it's pretty much pre qualification and conditional approval. The conditional approval means not only have I seen their pay stubs and bank statements, but my underwriter has, right? And the underwriter's already approved it. So, you know, there's less chance of that loan not being approved once they have a contract, right? Because they've already been approved. The only thing that may change at that point is if something crazy happens, right? So. Now that process takes takes place pretty early in the Atlantic Bay process. Yeah, I, I try to get it done as soon as possible. So basically- That separates Atlantic Bay and a couple other mortgage companies from other mortgage companies because yeah. they're pretty much doing their underwriting up front. So by the time we're at the home inspection, we're very, very content on where we're at. Whereas there's some yeah. banks and some transactions, I'm kind of wondering now all the way to the end, did yeah. they look at everything? You know, did they miss something? I've had that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've talked about like pre-qualification, that whole phase, um, you know, so I, I usually at that point I'll call Matt and say, Hey, look, John Smith's good to go. Um, you're ready to get out there and rock and roll. Um, and we're working on getting them conditionally approved at that point. Um, so from there, kind of Matt, why don't you take the next, take us to the next step. Okay. That, that being said, at this point, we've already had my meetup, plus mm -hmm. they're pre-approved. Next up is going and looking at houses. Um, our particular scenario is Christina helps me a lot, stay on top of the auto searches and the searches. So every morning we kind of run through the MLS looking at what's new, what's happened. Um, we have some clients that just get blasted every morning because they have such a broad spectrum of houses. Um, so we set up a list and it can be last minute. We work good under pressure. So if you just got approved and like, hey, I want to go look at this house, we can typically make it happen. Uh, what I like is to have several days in advance. We plan it. We plan the route. A lot of you know, a lot of people think that houses are, that are for sale are vacant, but they're not. They're occupied. They have pets. They have babies. Mm -hmm. Literally people. So planning is, is very key. Um, we go look at houses. You might look at three. You might look at 30. You might look in a week. You might look in six months. Like It's, it's up to you. I'm not a high pressure guy. Mm -hmm. Once you find the house, we make an offer, and we'll go over that at some point too, but you make an offer, and you might go back and forth once with the seller. You might go back and forth three times. It might take days or weeks of negotiating. It just depends on what you're trying to do and who they are and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Once you get the offer accepted, it becomes a ratified contract, and I like to tell people that's like when the stopwatch starts. That's when the clock starts ticking for all the inspections and all the things we predetermined in the contract. So offer, offer, counter offer. Bam, we come to an agreement, all parties sign. It's now a ratified contract, which means it's legal binding documents. Mm -hmm. And that's when we start on home inspection, termite moisture, and establish all those kind of things. Actually, they're established at ratification. And then our timeline starts and we perform those things. Yeah, so guys, I mean, we're talking about the, the steps of buying a home. And so we've kind of already talked on this pre-qualification, pre-processing loan application. We're now on this find a home in the contract phase, right? So... Like Matt said, you know, at that point, it's just finding the right home for you guys uh, and writing a contract. Um, and I think that that's really the key uh, with the uh, with any agent is they're going to provide a great opportunity. I know Matt does a fantastic job of uh, negotiating for his clients, you know, for his buyers, and, and kind of knowing he can t he can look up how long a home's been on the market and use those things to kind of gauge, you know, how, how he can protect his clients and, and get the best deal for them from there. Um, so you touched on a little bit earnest money deposit. When, when do they give the earnest money deposit um, if there is one with the contract? Earnest money deposit, most likely called a EMD. Um, it's like a good faith uh, deposit you put down as a buyer. There's no set amount. The most common we see between like just you know twenty thousand dollar houses all the way to two and three three fifty price tags is mm -hmm. five hundred to a thousand you can offer a ten thousand dollar earnest money there's no set number but five hundred to a thousand is normal 
and it's uh, usually a personal check made out to who you're going to close with or your agent's firm or even the listing agent's firm. Uh, you don't really want the seller holding that. You want one of the eight, one of the firms or one of the closers holding it. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, sometimes it's, it needs to be a certified check. That's when you're dealing with foreclosures. Um, yeah. Some sellers could require it too. And on the same note with foreclosures and auctions, sometimes it has to be 10% of the sales price. So then right. it can be a very large EMD. If you're in a multiple offer situation, if you're really competing hard for something, then if you have it, then I would suggest do a two thousand dollar earnest money, a four thousand dollar earnest money. You're gonna this money is gonna get pushed back in the transaction to you. It's just a holding place. Think of it as a down payment, but don't think of it as a loan down payment. When you put a down payment on something at a store, sometimes it's like a holding spot. Like, all right, Mister Seller, mm -hmm. I'm good for this. I really want your house. Please go under contract with me. Take your house off the market. Let's negotiate. Here's a grand. If mm -hmm. I breach the contract, and there's a lot of ways you can get out of it, but if I breach it in any way that really does wrong to the seller, the seller can then keep your money. Right. So, and again, so this earnest money deposit of five hundred, a thousand dollars, and you know, Matt really touched on something that he's he's so good. I was going to ask him about this, but he nailed it. Is you know, in in a hot market like this, it, one way to maybe set yourself apart is bumping that earnest money deposit up a little bit, right? Um, <clears throat> but that earnest money deposit, it's your money assuming you go through the process, right? But Matt touched on there are ways out of buying a home if you do it the right way, right? And you can still get that earnest money deposit back. Um, but basically- Never never it, to date the, had a buyer lose a earnest money deposit. Yeah. So uh, if, the seller side where we kept earnest money deposits when people did my clients wrong. Right. So, you know, again, you give a thousand dollar earnest money deposit and you have to put down- your down payment is $5,000, that $1,000 earnest money deposit will go towards that down payment. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. It's your money. It's just saying like, hey, I'm for real. I want to buy this property, right? So after that, you, you talked a little bit about home inspection. Why don't you talk a little bit more about that? Once you have a ratified contract, are you all done negotiating? No. Uh <laughs> The two, I, I think the two big hurdles that are so, the known yeah. hurdles anyway, is going to be price negotiation slash closing costs. So that initial offer turned into a contract. And then the second big hurdle um, is the home inspection slash termite moisture. Cause the crawl space I promise is like the hitting the hidden monster of the real estate transaction. Cause it's out of sight and out of mind. Um, I'm trying to not get off on tangents. No, uh, Home inspection, typical, you know, so from that ratification date, I usually try to do my termite and moisture and home inspection in 7, 10, 12 days. In a hot market, you want it to get as tight as possible because that's appealing to the seller because you're tying their house up. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in a hot market, a good inspector is going to be booked out. So 10 to 12 days is kind of a sweet spot, but you really got to jump on it and, and, you know, be ready. Home inspections are not mandatory. I don't know why in the world as a, as a normal buyer, or even investor, you shouldn't get a home inspection. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Home inspections are like two to $400. There's no reason you should be skipping them. Right. Termite moisture is pretty much mandatory. Uh, VA, FHA, and the way the contracts are written, just, just plan on considering termite moisture inspections mandatory for your loan, if you're getting a loan. Um, I like to time them on the same day. Some people don't do that, but I strive to get the both inspections on the same day at the same time. And, that way, if one person comes out and says something different than the other, we can address it right then and there and send them both back under there. I mean, I've had them yelling and screaming at each other there before because they have different opinions. Um, and you can always get a third opinion. But I try to knock out home inspection and termite moisture in the first seven to 10 days. And the big hurdle of that is the negotiation of repairs. A lot of people have lost the meaning of the home inspection and what it's for. When I'm on the buyer side, yeah, I. I I push them to ask for a lot when I'm on the seller side, I'm trying to defend off as much as possible. Um, trying to think of the key points to say here. Well, I, I think you know, uh, really as far as repairs stick, the best thing you can do is to stick with the safety stuff. So don't get off on tangents, worrying about a loose doorknob and, and right. 
paint chips or so something like that. Like concentrate on heating and cooling, plumb and electrical roof windows, big ticket items. And most sellers have been groomed by their agent and most sellers are reasonable in You'll try to come to a grill. Just just don't try to take advantage of them. But I will say you always have to ask for more than you want. The whole real estate game is a chess game. And this is where I really get excited and have fun. Like you always have to ask for more than you expect. One other thing I got to say, because I made this mistake on my first house. A lot of us, it's usually the young guys. Uh, they come from the construction world, handymen, dad's real involved. You know, we get to the home inspection. They're just so excited. They're so excited. Chris has approved them. They don't care about the repairs. And I did that. I made that mistake. Uh, um, my agent tried to tell me and I bought a house and hardly asked for anything. Just just imagine. I know you're planning on living here for five to 10 years. They tell me. But just say you inherit a large sum of money. There's a death in the family, a job relocation. You name it. For some reason, in like six months, you got to sell this house. All those things you ignored, I promise you the next buyer will not. So without being spiteful or taking advantage of the seller, you should ask for everything you can so that it's not on you because every house I've left, I had to spend weeks doing the punch list that I ignored when I bought the house every yeah. time. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, and and <clears throat> I think it's also important to know, I mean, to ask for more, right? I, I think that's huge. And, and to know that you, you need to, expect it. Remember, it's a negotiation still, right? Um, and one thing, uh, you know, everything's negotiable. So, you know, I, I, I like to say that when it comes to the contract and time to buy a home, you know, we were doing that uh, open house the other day on the water, right? And it's like, yeah, who knows? If you want, they have a boat. Maybe they don't need a boat after they move. You can always try and negotiate that in. Who knows? You never know. I've seen things where somebody got a riding lawnmower uh, mm -hmm. because the person was go moving into a condo, no longer needed a lawnmower, and the person moving in was a renter before and never had to mow their grass. So remember that, guys. Um, but yeah, so you touched on the main points of the home inspection. Uh, one thing I'll tell you is, you know, a lot of this stuff is happening at the same time. So while you're out looking for homes with Matt, we're working on getting you conditionally approved, um, and We've gotten you completely submitted the underwriting. You've come out of underwriting. You submit a contract. We submit the conditional approval letter over to you guys uh, to offer. Um, and then, you know, once you have the contract, we're submitting you to underwriting as a with the new con uh, with the property and the contract and how much closing costs you're getting from the seller, all those fun things, um, and working on getting you approved at that point. But one thing that I like to do is I try and hold off on ordering appraisals. Um, and I know a lot of most people do hold off on ordering an appraisal until we've completely finished that. Uh, well, the home inspection, I was going to say the picker, right? Which is the property inspection, contingency, removal, addendum. I think I nailed it. <laughs> yeah, no, you got it. Oh, sorry. I was yes. next thing I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, once, once, that gets fully ratified. That's usually, you know, Matt will give me a call and say, hey, we're all set on the property, on the PICRA, on the property inspection contingency removal addendum, and uh, we're ready to order the appraisal. So um, then I'll call you, say, hey, look, we're approved. Here's some of the items we need. My processor and I will work with you on those, and I'm going to go ahead and order the appraisal. The uh, idea is to not burn burn our clients' money. Right. You know, the just like Chris said, everything's negotiable. The order in our timeline, everything's negotiable. But if you're working with an agent and you have an agent on the seller side, there's something to be said about the process that's kind of been established. You know, um, it's it's in everybody's best interest to kind of follow the order of the process. Um, right. There's no point in dropping five, six, however much money on an appraisal if you haven't even done the termite moisture and home inspection yet, because you might walk away from the house. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's a reason for it. Sometimes we're trying to do a two or three week closing. So yeah, you, you've got to burn that money. You've got to order that appraisal before you inspect it. I'll tell you this. I hate doing that because it's all a chess game. It's all, it's all playing a game. So if the, if the seller know they're going to know that you ordered the appraisal because the appraiser is going to contact the listing agent to set up a time for them to get in the house. So once the seller knows you've ordered the appraisal, you've lost a lot of leverage in my mind with most sellers for repairs. 
Mm-hmm. They could just come back to you and say no on all the things because they think you're so committed. You've already ordered the appraisal and you're buying the house no matter what. Yeah. When I receive a PICRA, property inspection contingency removal, didn't I? Um, when I receive one with a list of repairs and then two minutes later, the agent says, and we ordered the appraisal for Monday. I'm like, nice. That means, yeah. you know, I'm not going to just say no. I'm not going to suggest to my seller to not do anything, but it's definitely like a relief of, man, they like the house that much. You know, we can definitely scratch some stuff off. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes sellers, I mean, the buyer, 500 bucks isn't nothing to them and they'll, they'll still walk away. So you still got you still got to play the game, right? Sure. No, I agree. Um, yeah. So, you know, the last thing we'll talk about is that appraisal. Um, and we're not going to get into the full appraisal process, but you know, there's a big difference between, and let me show this again. So again, we've already talked about pre-qualifying processing, finding the home, writing the contract. We've done the home inspection and, uh, now we're ordering the appraisal up here. Uh, right. Um, so there's a big difference between a, an appraisal and a home inspection, right? The home inspection is just going to tell the, or the appraisal is just going to tell you kind of the market value of the property, right? They're not going to tell you, you know, the condition of the HVAC unit, the hot water heater, the roof, stuff like that. Um, now they may, uh, depending on the type of appraisal you're getting, look at some things more, um, in particular, or or uh, more strenuously that, than on a conventional appraisal, maybe on an FHA or VA, they may look at some other things a little more difficultly. Um, I don't know if I worded that right, <laughs> but uh, but and then the home inspection is really where you're going to see the age of those things, right? They're going to give you roughly the age of the HVAC unit, the hot water heater, stuff like that. So. Um, what I tell people is the home inspection is optional. The appraisal is pretty much mandatory when you're dealing with a loan. Yep. The home inspection is for your information is for your eyes only or whoever you want to share it to. The appraiser is technically working for the bank. Okay. He's protecting you, but the bank's protecting you. So at the end of the day, the appraiser is working for the bank, making sure the, the loan is justifiable for them to loan on. Um, there's a misconception. I, I run into this a lot with people's parents and things have changed over the years. So the last time someone's parents bought a house might've been the eighties or nineties or, you know, whenever, um, a house doesn't have to pass some inspection. There's nothing to, you know, that's not going to pass. That's not going to pass the inspection. Yeah. It might come up on the inspection. You can ask for it to be fixed, but the only thing that really matters to pass is the appraisal. And he, he's, he's going to spend and, and I was, I've always been leery to say this cause I don't want to take away from appraisers, but CMP the other day said it word for word, exactly what I tell buyers. The appraiser comes to the house for like 10 or 15 minutes. He might poke his head in the crawl space. He might poke his head in the attic, but highly doubt it. He's walking around it. He's counting bedrooms. He's measuring square footage and he's looking at overall like safety and condition. You know, is, is the bricks all cracked up? Is handrails missing or windows broke? Mm-hmm. Are the shingles missing? Does it have an oven if it's a VA loan? Um, the appraiser spends hours on the computer after that. It's more about value and comps than it is an inspection. So just mm-hmm. think of the home inspection is very hands on tools, you know, flashlights. Appraisal is really a, a done at a computer. Um, and they're about comps. Yeah, I'm trying not to go into too many details. No, yeah, that, that's great. So, yeah, I mean, I think we've kind of talked about most of the first half of the home buying process. And so we'll do another one of these to kind of talk about the rest of the home buying process. Uh, but, yeah, we just wanted to do a quick one real, uh, really for everybody so they could get we an idea. spend 30 minutes on every topic, you know, and oh, some of the best way to – describe these things like surveys. I mean, you could just go on and on. The best way to, I think, explain them is actually to tell stories, like good stories and bad stories. And that's what I do. And that's why my buyer consults take a while. Yeah. Um, But to reiterate, just at the end, can you still see me? Timeline wise, you can't see my hands, but timeline, you know, pre-approval. I like a nice first time buy. I can't stand going to a house without a buyer consult first. Cause then we can't even talk about ring doorbells and things to say and how I can't say what I want. You know, mm-hmm. we need to have a meeting up front. Then once we look at houses, we make an offer. Once we make an offer, we get accepted at some point and it becomes ratified. That's when the stopwatch starts from the stopwatch starting at ratified. We're looking at home inspection, termite moisture, any particular order. We might do other repairs. The home inspection might reveal that you really want a chimney or a HVAC inspection. So we squeeze them in there. That's, that's, you know, we can fit that. 
And then we almost kind of go into this like limbo stage, termite moisture. And then we go into this like drawn out kind of limbo stage. Most appraisers have what, like two weeks ish to report back. So in that two week period is when Chris and the underwriters and the, the, the process are all kind of like pinging you for tax stuff, more documentation, just double checking everything they have to do for all the, the red tape in the lending world. And seller at that time is doing some repairs and things like that. So we're almost kind of in a limbo. So there's like this hurry, hurry, hurry up, wait, hurry up, wait. And then we close. Yeah. That helped or not. No, I, I think that that's perfectly, perfectly said, you know, like you said, it, there's a whole lot of action in the beginning. And then there's this whole time in the middle there where it's like, uh, so what am I doing? <laughs> and sometimes that gets filled. I mean, we didn't we sure. talk two hours on flood insurance and elevation yeah. starts and overcoming high yeah. numbers there. We can talk about surveys. There's a lot of stuff that that limbo stage might right. get sucked up by, especially if there's condo docs, POA docs. Mm -hmm. So you'll be busy. It's just a lot of yeah, action. Sure. Front, it's not that it's, you're not going to be doing anything, right? Because, you know, uh, as a lender, there are going to be documents that we need. Um, you know, you're going to be shopping for homeowners insurance, potentially flood insurance, things like that. But, you know, the, the main portion is that beginning, you know, half, right? So, um, guys, I want to thank you guys for watching. Uh, Matt, you got anything to add? I, I got to throw our disclosure up there one last time, but uh, anything else you want to add? Sorry, but yeah, there was something I wanted to say earlier and I forgot. In, in today's world with Zillow and all these sites, we got awesome 3D tours, Matterport. I don't spend hours preparing to tell you about houses we're going to go look at. Like a lot of times when I go out with the buyers, they know about what I know. My job really kicks in once they say they like a house. So right. with with video and technology and even the live open houses, a lot of times I'm just opening doors for you while we're looking at the house. And I'm giving you input and I'm telling you things I see. But like I don't even feel like my job gets to kick in until we have an offer. And that's when like I get excited. I get pumped up. I don't shut up. Like that's when I get to negotiate and I feel like I earn my value to people. And I don't think anybody I've worked with and most agents, um, I think everybody would agree that our jobs really get to kick in once we have an offer in today's world. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, and that was something I was going to mention earlier as well. You know, when I asked you about like, you know, any, yeah, you can go out and find a house without a real estate agent these days, right. With all these websites and stuff like that. But you have no idea how much a home is really worth. You have no idea what you should be offering. You don't know what you should be negotiating for or, or what you think you may be negotiating against. You have no idea what questions to even ask so a student agent, right? Um, without a good buyer's agent working with you. Um, you know, so a buyer's agent, you know, helping you find that home, that's part of the job. And it, it's a yeah, it's I, decent I important. I promise you that uh, I or most agents would blow your mind once we get going. You know, yeah. once we find the house. Yeah, one, one, th that's that's where you really stand out is the negotiation. I agree. So um, again, guys, thanks for doing this, uh, for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments. Here's our little disclosure here. Uh, let me get rid of this. Um, so. Um, yeah. Do you make these things or do you have like... No, nah, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I find them online. <laughs> I, I just go out and find them online. That one's a good one. Yeah, I liked it. Um, so yeah, guys, remember, give us a shout. Let us know what you think. There's our phone number there. Um, you, and our website's underneath www.rocksteadygroup.com for Matt and www.chrisricemortgage.com for me and right. we work well as a team but you know if you have an agent you can still use chris i appreciate that man all right guys thanks a lot have a good one have a good weekend man